In this lecture, I'll talk about neural networks, deep learning, and artificial intelligence. The purpose of this lecture is to be introductory. So first I'll give a brief overview of what artificial intelligence is and where it is implemented. Then I'll explain what a neural network is and how it relates to regression analysis. I'll also explain some of the properties of neural networks and how you can train one. Then we'll talk about deep learning and convolutional neural networks. And finally I'll show some notable examples of neural networks and I'll give a brief discussion about whether AI is safe and how you can start using it. If you're watching this video in the context of the advanced biostatistics course, then uh, it's important to note that this is just an introductory uh, lecture and I want to show as much as I can in the limited amount of time we have, but you don't have to remember all of this. Uh, if you're able to answer the four questions listed here, so what is a neural network, what is deep learning, uh, what would you use it for, and what are the advantages and disadvantages compared to the methods that you learned so far, then that is more than enough. So the purpose of this lecture is mainly to introduce you to the nomenclature, so the jargon used in deep learning, uh, because this is one of the most influential and rapidly developing technologies of our time. So I think that it's important that you have at least some idea of what it is. If you like this, and if you want to learn more about deep learning, then I suggest you read the book uh, called Deep Learning Book by MIT, and you can find it by just going to deeplearningbook.org. All right. So artificial intelligence is the use of computer algorithms to make decisions in an intelligent way or in a seemingly intelligent way. Um, so a distinction is often made between weak AI, which means that it is working uh, or applying intelligence to a specific task and strong AI, which means that it can apply intelligence generally. Now there is a revolution going on of artificial intelligence being applied everywhere. And that is a revolution of weak AI. So we don't possess any strong AI. And to my knowledge, there are no serious advantages, uh, sorry, advances in uh, the development of strong AI either. So there are two major approaches to AI, um, or at least there used to be. Uh, one is called the knowledge base and the other is called uh, learning. So machine learning or statistical learning. So the knowledge base is to simply have a very large set of rules, which is the knowledge base. And then you need an inference engine to make decisions based on those rules. So it is a very logical uh, way to approach intelligence. Uh, but of course, the disadvantage is that you need almost every rule you can think of and then some. Um, so the learning approach is uh, very different. It relates the input to the output with a probabilistic function. Uh, and that's the same that we've, we've been doing so far, like in regression analysis, where we have uh, the input, which uh, are the explanatory variables, and we have the output, which is the response variable. And the function that we learn is a probabilistic function, meaning that uh, even if it makes errors, we can still on average make uh, good predictions. So uh, yeah, learning works by slowly changing the parameters of the function with each example that is shown. And you can do this all at once, like we've been doing so far with regression analysis, which is called batch learning. Uh, or you can do it step by step, uh, which is called online learning or um, mini batch. And uh, I'll explain these later on in the uh, lecture. So it's important to know that the knowledge base, so rule based artificial intelligence uh, has not been very successful. And that almost everything that you know, uh, where AI is being applied is AI based on neural networks. And these are learning algorithms. So some examples of use of AI. Um, now you probably all know that there are uh, experiments going on with self-driving cars, and these use uh, a number of different neural networks. Some perform image segmentation to recognize different objects in the video feed, like cyclers or pedestrians or roads or signs. Um, and there's AI assisted diagnosis, which can uh, yeah, help a doctor make a decision based on an image where uh, usually for a doctor, there would be much less uh, precision. Uh, and you've probably all heard of deep fakes, where we can now finally see Nicolas Cage's face on uh, Trump while he's giving a speech. Uh, but also natural language processing, which is, uh, for example, Google Translate uh, is based on this, uh, where you have as input a variable length of uh, um, text, and then uh, you try to translate it to uh, the, uh, the uh, language of interest. Another example is facial recognition. So as soon as you turn on your camera on your phone, 
there is a pre-trained neural network that knows what a face is supposed to look like and tries to detect it from the image. And another classical example is spam detection, where an algorithm simply has to decide this is spam, yes, or this is ham, no. Um, yeah, all of these fields are dominated by methods based on neural networks. So in the past, some of these things like facial recognition were also tackled by different algorithms. But uh, yeah, as of 2020, all of this works with neural networks and everything else performs worse. So what is a neural network? Uh, it is essentially a form of regression. Specifically, it's a nonlinear kind of regression that uses hidden layers. So in this example, we have uh, as outcome blood pressure, and let's say that we have four variables, age, weight, height, and salt intake. And in regression analysis, we just see the direct effect of each of these variables on the outcome. Uh, whereas in the neural network, first, we combine the input variables in many different ways, and then we learn how each combination affects the output. So both of these, regression analysis and neural networks, relate the input to the output using a probabilistic function. Uh, but what makes a neural network special it is, is that it tries to combine the inputs in many different ways. So a neural network tries to sum all these different combinations uh, to predict the output. And uh, each combination is called a node. So that's the red circles that I've shown here. And then the collection of nodes is called uh, the hidden layer. So in total, we have the input layer, the hidden layer, and the output layer. And that's all there is to a simple neural network. Neural networks can have uh, many nodes, uh, usually even more than there are input variables, which is called overcompleteness. Uh, and of course, that means that you have many, many different parameters uh, that you can learn. Um, and because of that, neural networks are very, very prone to overfitting. So we have to perform some form of regularization. Now, um, there are also undercomplete networks uh, where we do the opposite, where we try to reduce the number of variables to a smaller amount, uh, just like we would do, for example, in PCA. So an undercomplete network performs a kind of dimension reduction, uh, learning a simpler representation of the input, whereas an overcomplete network can learn very complex nonlinear representations of the input and how this large representation relates to the output. Now, as I've said before, these models uh, are very uh, data hungry. <laughs> they uh, have a lot of parameters. And usually, we don't have data sets large enough to train each parameter um, separately. So we have to perform some form of regularization. Now, you've already learned about lasso and rich in the regularization network. And this is often used in uh, neural networks, where we simply constrain the sum of all the weights to some amount. Um, but something that's used uh, also a lot in neural networks, perhaps even more, is dropout, which is a very simple algorithm that works really, really well uh, by randomly omitting a fraction of the nodes in each training step. So what that means is um, a neural network is not trained in one step, but in many different uh, learning steps. And at, every, uh, at each of those steps, uh, some fraction, so in this case, three out of seven are randomly ignored, and the neural network has to do it with only uh, the remaining nodes that are in the network. Now, you might be wondering why on earth would that work? Uh, but the answer is actually quite simple. By omitting, by omitting some nodes at each step of the training process, you force the network to learn robust features. So uh, what that means is if you don't have dropouts and you have access to the entire uh, source material, then anything of the source material would help, whether it's uh, that this part should be black or that it casts a shadow or simply that the center part of the image is darker than the corners of the image, anything works. Whereas if you randomly remove what the network is allowed to use, then it has to learn that whatever features are present um, must be features that are actually important to the output. So if, let's say that we have a network that's predicting is there a rabbit in this picture, yes or no, then uh, a network with dropouts might be able to learn some features that are so robust, like the shape of the ears or the overall shape of the rabbit, that uh, we can see even if the rabbit is uh, partially covered or in different lighting, that it's still a rabbit. All right, so um, yeah, another example, uh, which actually has a different reason, but it's something that might happen uh, if you uh, wouldn't use a proper regularization, is that the wrong features are being learned. 
So in the uh, other video that I've linked, which is called Lessons from Machine Learning, uh, Lessons Learned from Machine Learning Gone Wrong, uh, there's an example where uh, researchers tried to uh, teach a network what a specific species of fish looks like. And all it learned is shapes of fingers. And the reason is that the uh, source material consisted of photos with uh, people holding the fish. So yeah, if you don't restrict what it is allowed to learn, and of course, if you only have examples of fish with uh, people holding them, then uh, there's no reason why the network wouldn't learn some feature that isn't of interest at all, like fingers, which have nothing to do with the fish in this case. Um, yeah, so I advise you to uh, uh, watch this other video. It's entertaining and it also shows uh, a little bit how neural networks work and uh, how uh, some things don't work. So at around the uh, 28 minute mark, uh, she explains this uh, fish example. And yeah, uh, just like any other statistical model, your sample will define what you can generalize the results to. If you only have pictures of fish being held by humans, then you cannot generalize it to any picture of this fish. The next part of a neural network is its activation function, which is simply a kind of transformation. And this is what makes a neural network nonlinear. So in linear regression, each variable has an intercept and a slope. So uh, that's the same as saying that the activations would be linear in neural network terms. Uh, whereas in an actual neural network, uh, the hidden layers are often connected to the output with uh, a nonlinear uh, function, like the rectified linear unit is often used in regression and a sigmoid function in classification problems. And this transformation allows the uh, relationship to be learned to be different than linear. So uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go into too much detail uh, because this is just an introductory lecture and um, yeah, it's not supposed to be uh, very in-depth, but a nonlinear activation allows the network to learn more complex relationships between the input and output. And that's what makes it truly different from just a regression with many different interactions of the input. So uh, yeah, like I said, for example, continuous outcomes often use uh, rectified linear units or exponential linear units or leaky rectified linear units. And uh, categorical outcomes, uh, which is for classification purposes, often use the sigmoid or a 10H function. Now, again, you don't have to memorize this, uh, but if you're interested in this, there is a large list of uh, commonly used uh, activation functions and why you would use one over the other in this function over here, uh, in this question over here. So uh, the next part is the loss function. Once you've defined uh, your network's uh, configuration, so the number of nodes and uh, what kind of activation function, then you have to specify a loss function. Now, again, making the comparison with regression analysis, if we have a normal linear regression, then what we try to do is we minimize the sum of squared errors. So we have some predicted value by our model, and we have the true response variable as recorded, and we try to minimize the squared differences. Um, yeah, so for non-normally distributed errors, this isn't a good measure to optimize. For example, uh, if you use your network for classification, then you have a categorical outcome which uh, because it's categorical clearly does not go from minus infinity to infinity or is symmetric or any of the other properties that normally distributed errors have. So in this case, you would uh, usually use what's called uh, cross entropy, which looks like this. Um, yeah, and this function can be interpreted as the uh, average numbers of, number of bits that you would need to encode data coming from uh, one distribution P when we use the model Q. And uh, yeah, again, these details are not uh, particularly important for this lecture. Um, but uh, yeah, if you do want to learn about this, uh, I recommend this book called uh, Deep Learning Book, which I mentioned before. Uh, but overall, the purpose is to find a loss function, which uh, uh, if chosen correctly, when it is minimized, it will maximize the predictive performance of the model. Finally, then we need an optimizer, which is the function that minimizes the loss function. Now, almost all commonly used optimizers are a form of what's called stochastic gradient descent. Um, so, so far we've been using methods that use all the data at once. Um, but yeah, instead of using all examples at once, which is also called batch learning, uh, in neural networks, we usually use mini batches. So that's a uh, subset of your data and you keep giving it different subsets and then you start over. Um, so the gradient, which is the direction to move the function in to improve the objective, so to minimize the uh, uh, loss function, 
is calculated for each minute batch and the parameters are then slightly pushed towards the optimal solution for this particular mini batch. Now, if you repeat this many times, so you have many different gradient updates for all your mini batches, and then you do it multiple times across the entire uh, sample size, uh, and every time you do it across one sample size called an epoch, then uh, the average move by stochastic gradient descent will be towards the global optimum. Finally, then, uh, yeah, to understand neural networks, you have to understand what backpropagation is, which is the way in which the weights are updated. So the weights of a neural network are these connections between uh, each uh, individual component. Uh, so you could in interpret them as the coefficients that you have in regression analysis. And uh, it's called backpropagation because it works by going uh, from the output and then uh, computing the gradient by uh, matrix derivatives. And with that, you update the first weights uh, to the output layer. And using that, you backpropagate to the previous layer to update these weights. And because that's in reverse order from how you would usually predict, it's called backpropagation. So the change in coefficients, or the weights, is calculated from the output layer towards the input layer. What is then deep learning? So a neural network is not restricted to a single hidden layer. In fact, you can use many different hidden layers, and that's what's called deep learning. Um, so when we refer to the depth of a network, what we mean is the number of hidden layers. So a reason you might want to do that is because you don't think that combinations of the input are important, but combinations of the combinations, or combinations of the combinations of the combinations, etc. And uh, this allows the network to make more and more uh, complex abstractions of the input and how those relate to the output. So the depth is the number of hidden layers and the width is the number of nodes. So a wider network is wide like this and a deeper network is deep like this. So why are deep neural networks so popular? Uh, the reason, like I said, is because they're able to make abstractions. So in this example, uh, we have uh, three hidden layers, but usually you would have many more. Um, but uh, yeah, just for the example's sake, let's say we have a large database of images of people's faces. Then yeah, if we just take combinations of the input, which would be the uh, pixel intensities of these images, then uh, all you can really learn is rudimentary shapes like edges and corners and differences in contrast. And is this pixel uh, white or is this pixel black? Um, but if you start combining these shapes into another hidden layer, then you can get actual shapes that are relevant to the image, like a nose or an eye or a mouth. Uh, and finally, if we combine the different features that have been learned, we can make entire faces. And this is how the input is related to the output in a deep neural network. So uh, this is called hierarchical feature representation. And successive combinations of combinations of the input can learn more complex relationships with the output. Uh, deep learning is particularly good at image recognition because it doesn't just use uh, a large number of layers, but it also uses convolutional layers. Now, a convolutional layer uh, conceptually is very simple. Uh, it takes a group of pixels from the previous layer and uh, it then uh, pulls those all together into the value of the next layer. So that means that adjacent pixels are somehow related to each other, uh, which allows the network to make associations with different regions of the uh, uh, original input image. So uh, yeah, if you do this for many different layers, so first you have uh, this group of pixels and you compress it into a single one, and then you have different uh, compressed versions of the original image and you uh, convol convolve again and again and again, then you can make more and more complex abstractions. And that is how these shapes are learned. So uh, that's all about uh, convolution. Uh, but now I think it's also nice to uh, mention some notable examples. Uh, so for example, uh, there's the Deep Dream Network, which uses intermediary layers abstractions to show how the network sees an image. Um, so it works uh, as follows. You first train an image on uh, many, uh, sorry, you train a network on many different images. And uh, then you look at the intermediary layers to see uh, what, how the network is actually uh, compressing this image into different shapes. Now, uh, this goes a lot further. I'll briefly show this link. 
um, where you can even have the network uh, be fed uh, random noise. And uh, yeah, just because it has learned from the input images, it can construct entire new images from random noise. Uh, yeah, so how it works is a bit too technical for introductory lecture, uh, but I think it's very interesting uh, what this network can do. And another very interesting example is uh, what's called generative adversarial networks, uh, which is two different networks that are uh, both trained at the same time. And one network is supposed to do a task, and the other network is trying to uh, determine whether uh, the output is from a neural network or real. So one is checking the other's work. And uh, in this particular example, they used this uh, method of generative adversarial networks to create images from descriptions. So these images are not real. Uh, all the network was uh, taught was that uh, there's a bird with a bright yellow body with br brown on its crown and wings. And just from this text, the network has generated all these different images that satisfy uh, the input. And uh, yeah, here they show that their method is better than other methods. Uh, but yeah, there are many different networks that can actually do this. So um, yeah, have a look at these, like for example, this one's supposed to be red with black wings. And the network has created an entire image with an out of focus background, probably because it learned from a lot of input images where the background was blurred. Uh, another interesting example is uh, an uh, algorithm trained by uh, NVIDIA. Uh, which takes uh, simple drawings or doodles as uh, input. And then, uh, yeah, just by uh, looking at the different colors of your doodle, it will make a photorealistic landscape. So yeah, if you choose gray, it knows, okay, I have to draw clouds here. And if you choose uh, light blue, it says, okay, uh, that's supposed to be, uh, well, water, I guess. So here's a waterfall and brown. Probably if you hadn't drawn this, there wouldn't be a waterfall. And if you hadn't made this, uh, um, purple, then there wouldn't have been a river. So just from this very simple crude drawing, the network has generated an entire image that is reasonably convincing um, of a, a photorealistic landscape. So in discussion then, uh, neural networks, deep learning and AI, uh, yeah, what do all the terms mean? AI is really often synonymously used with deep learning models. And uh, AI is a different field of research than uh, yeah, then deep learning or neural networks, but there is a lot of overlap. Um, so in general, AI is just trying to apply intelligence to a problem. But like I mentioned in the beginning of the uh, lecture, most of the time when we say AI, we're talking about uh, AIs that are using deep learning models. And then there might be some decision function on top of that from the results of the deep learning. But really, most of it is deep learning. Well, what is then deep learning? It is simply a neural network that uses multiple hidden layers. And uh, okay, what is then a neural network? That's just a kind of nonlinear regression using hidden layers, which are uh, nodes consisting of combinations of the input. Now, AI is extremely good at extremely precise tasks, uh, for which it has seen many, meaning tens or hundreds of thousands of examples. And uh, yeah, like as you can see from here, the results can be extremely impressive. Uh, but if you would ask this same network, to uh, draw an image that has one pixel less on the side, it would do nothing because it hasn't been trained on that. And if you use any, of, uh, any other color than what's shown here, it also won't work because it doesn't know what to do with that input. So uh, yeah, that reveals a little bit about uh, what a neural network does and yeah, whether it's thinking or not, or just a function, um, because it's uh, very dependent on uh, the uh, exact specifications of the input and it must exactly match what you use to train. So uh, to uh, better understand the limitations of uh, the current weak AI that uh, we use, which is very impressive, but it is still weak AI, uh, I really recommend watching this video of which I showed the slide before called uh, Lessons Learned from Machine Learning Gone Wrong. Uh, it's entertaining, uh, but it's also very informative because it shows you a little bit about uh, what the state of the art is and what AI can and cannot do. Uh, which, yeah, which then lead to the question, uh, is an AI intelligent or is it just, uh, yeah, is it just a calculation? So there's a lot of debate on what constitutes actual intelligence. And, you know, you could argue that uh, what we saw in the previous examples, that's an application of intelligence. And it's using uh, what it's learned from examples uh, to do something completely new. 
So uh, yeah, by virtue of definition, you could say that that's intelligence and you wouldn't necessarily be wrong. But it's important to keep in mind that a neural network is just a function, just like uh, regression analysis and uh, all the other methods that you learned. Uh, in the end, it's just a calculation. And when the training is finished, it always performs the same calculation. Um, yeah, and the function changes its decision uh, based on every example it has seen, uh, but it isn't always learning. Uh, the network is only learning while you are allowing it to learn, uh, which costs a lot of processing power. But for example, the, the camera in your phone isn't learning anything when you point it at someone. It's just using a pre-trained network, um, and that's making predictions based on the uh, uh, inputs from the camera. So, uh, yeah, finally, what we call learning is uh, yeah, really statistical learning or machine learning. And uh, it isn't learning in the same way that we do, but it's really just backpropagation of errors. So taking the derivative of the matrix of errors compared to the actual input, uh, sorry, predicted input, uh, and then, uh, yeah, updating the weights. And yeah, of course, we don't know for certain whether that's how the brain works or not, but uh, yeah, we, we know that it probably does not involve matrix, matrix multiplication. Um, but then again, uh, perhaps there is some uh, decision function that's made in your brain uh, using some other similar way, or at least an analogous. Finally, then, the question that uh, very often arises is whether artificial intelligence is safe. And uh, there are many valid uh, concerns regarding the uh, safety and uh, the ethics of current weak AI, even though it's weak. Uh, for example, facial recognition algorithms almost always have very serious biases towards overrepresented groups in the training examples. Uh, a clear example being, for example, um, if you look up uh, HP printer uh, does not recognize black person, uh, there used to be um, an, an AI that does facial recognition, but yeah, the training set mostly consisted of uh, uh, people with white skin color. So yeah, it doesn't recognize uh, people with other skin color very well. And there were Nikon cameras, uh, which uh, kept asking uh, Asian users whether they were blinking. So these can have very uh, unwanted side effects. Another example is if you would have a diagnostic artificial intelligence that is supposed to predict uh, whether you have a very rare disease or not, uh, then there's a problem. Because uh, if the disease is rare, the network can just say nobody has the disease. And then we'll have a very high accuracy because it classifies everyone who doesn't have the disease correctly. Now, there are ways to counter this, but uh, it is something that will happen if you don't pay attention. Uh, another example is Amazon, which uh, yeah, used uh, an AI help hiring algorithm for uh, selecting applicants uh, to work at the company. And it turned out that this hiring algorithm uh, discriminated against women because it compared against the database of uh, current employees, which were mostly men. Um, and then uh, it found out from the resumes that these people were women, so they were less likely to be selected. Even though the fact that they were female was not in the application, it was hidden from the network. But just by looking at the uh, language used and whether they went to a uh, women-only college, or some other information somewhere in the resume, the network could infer which applicants were women and then disqualify them. Um, yeah, and finally, another infamous example uh, was uh, an item recommendation algorithm, which uh, supermarkets uh, use a lot uh, to send you folders with, uh, yeah, or you know, maybe on your smartphone, it's in an app, it will show you commercials that are specifically aimed at you. Uh, and uh, the supermarket chain Target also used this. Uh, and they had an algorithm that would start recommending uh, different uh, food items if you are pregnant. And in a lot of cases, this resulted in uh, people uh, yeah, being revealed that they were pregnant without uh, the women even knowing it, or perhaps they hadn't told their partners yet. Uh, so these are all very serious uh, concerns. Now, um, yeah, these are, I think, some of the uh, very real concerns of uh, current use of AI. Uh, but this is completely distinct from the discussion of uh, is AI going to take over the world or something, which is completely irrelevant to uh, what we have just been talking about because we don't have strong AI. All we have is weak AI. Um, so, yeah, uh, 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 artificial intelligence that can uh, uh, use intelligence generally is often called an artificial general intelligence, uh, but there are no such algorithms yet. And we don't even know if it's possible to make such an algorithm. 
uh, and if it is possible, I don't think that we're anywhere near close to developing one. So uh, yeah, with those uh, side notes, uh, yeah, there are some serious concerns if it would be possible to make artificial general intelligence. And I think a very uh, interesting example is the uh, paperclip maximizer by uh, Nick Bostrom. And um, yeah, it goes as follows. Suppose that there's a company that keeps running out of paper clips and uh, yeah, the boss is really frustrated by this. And uh, so he orders uh, an intern or maybe his AI division or something uh, to use the most powerful AI they can come up with to maximize the number of paper clips. And uh, yeah, without their intention to do so, uh, the artificial intelligence turns into an artificial general intelligence, which uh, yeah, for reasons uh, I can't go into detail about now, I don't think is possible, but just imagine that it would happen. Then, uh, yeah, Nick said that uh, suppose you have an AI whose only goal is to make as many paper clips, then the AI will quickly uh, realize that if there are uh, humans, uh, it should get rid of them because uh, humans might turn off the AI. And if, uh, if the AI is turned off, it cannot make paper clips anymore. And in addition, you know, we are just taking up space and we are taking up molecules and there's only a finite number of molecules in the universe. So the AI would probably quickly try to get rid of us to make more paper clips. Um, so yeah, it's a very extreme example. And uh, yeah, we can debate the realism of the example and also artificial general intel intelligence don't exist yet, nor for the foreseeable future. Um, but yeah, these thoughts experiments are interesting. So it's uh, nice to think about, but it's also nice uh, if you realize that uh, this is completely irrelevant to the current revolution of artificial intelligence. And I also think that uh, these kinds of extreme examples are undermining uh, the real dangers of current AI, which is discrimination and sexism and uh, other unwanted side effects. Finally then, um, yeah, neural networks and deep learning and any currently used implementation uh, for using weak AI is really just as safe as any other statistical tool if it's used correctly. Uh, but yeah, just like other statistical tools, uh, you can fool people with this and uh, you can, uh, uh, if you don't pay attention, learn the completely wrong task. So it's also just as dangerous as any other statistical tool when it's used incorrectly, especially when we start applying it to medical science or uh, in your smartphone uh, or other applications that might have very wide consequences. With that out of the way, uh, if you do want to uh, start doing more predictive modeling and you have a data set that consists of a very large number of independent observations, then you could consider trying deep learning. And if you do, uh, there's a very nice and very thorough introduction uh, in the book called uh, Deep Learning Book by MIT. Uh, but this book is quite technical and it also assumes that you're uh, fairly comfortable uh, reading over all the math. Uh, so if you do want to uh, read it, um, I recommend that you first try and read uh, Elements of Statistical Learning, uh, which is the uh, yeah, more difficult version of uh, Introduction to Statistical Learning, which is the book that Harold posted on uh, Brightspace. Uh, the book is free. You can just go to this link and then uh, download it. And uh, yeah, uh, I think it's very good and very thorough. And uh, this will teach you how you can properly evaluate um, whether your model is doing what it's supposed to do. And uh, yeah, a lot more of the um, uh, advantages and disadvantages of different methods and uh, cases uh, where you would want to sample in a particular way. So it's a very good basis for starting to learn about predictive modeling. And yeah, if you can get through this, uh, then I would recommend uh, reading an actual book on artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah, I try to keep it as short as possible because uh, if you have time, I really recommend that you also have a look at uh, two minute papers uh, and find an interesting uh, neural network maybe, um, because this uh, channel uh, shows uh, various different papers uh, that do stuff like the uh, generating images from text and uh, yeah, other, other noteworthy examples. So it's very nice to uh, pique your interest in AI. Uh, and the other video that I really recommend you watch is uh, the lecture on uh, machine learning gone wrong, uh, which I'll also link in the description. Um, and yeah, if you have, uh, uh, time left. I also made an uh, uh, example in R how you can start using AI using the package Keras. And um, yeah, you might be thinking, oh, I thought AI was all in Python. And uh, that's true. So Keras is really just a way to control uh, uh, TensorFlow, which runs in Python. Uh, but we can all do it comfortably from within R, so you don't have to learn anything new to start using it. Um, yeah, the example uh, I will uh, 
elaborate it on, on it more uh, when we get to the lecture. Uh, but um, yeah, suffice it to say that if you get stuck in installation issues, I recommend you just uh, skip the exercise and instead uh, watch the video that I linked below uh, or maybe work on your uh, graded assignment. Uh, all right, so that's all. Uh, thank you all for listening and I will explain the assignment more uh, when it's uh, time for that.